late morning if you're on the West Coast. Uh, welcome everybody. My name is Omar Duque and I'm the president of High Tech. Um, I'm extremely excited to welcome all of you today for our webinar uh, with Andres Angelani, Transforming While Performing, Embracing the Digital Transformation Journey. Uh, this is part of our High Tech Live series, uh, a series of, of webinars and other uh, live and virtual content that we launched on March 20th. I believe this is the ninth um, webinar that we hold uh, since then. Um, and we're um, extremely excited uh, that all of you continue to join us um, and, and participate with us and engage with us uh, during these uh, unique times of disruption. Um, extremely excited for today's presentation um, and extremely excited to introduce Andres Angelani, the CEO of Cognizant uh, Soft Vision, uh, a software product engineering company in a division of Cognizant Digital Businesses. Um, Andres, is, as you'll learn, is, a, is an accomplished uh, author and in, in 2019 was recognized by High Tech as one of the top 100 technology executive leaders uh, in the US. Uh, he's a frequent speaker and thought leader on how to scale digital innovation in organizations and how to build a culture of learning and mastery. He's also a member of the Alliance of Chief Executives and the Forbes Technology Council. We're extremely uh, excited to have Andres today, and we're just uh, excited to have him be a part of the high tech community um, and his interest in, in giving back and being part of this incredibly dynamic community of leaders. We're so happy to have you here. Andres, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you for taking the time on a Friday uh, to listen to me. Um, so we're, we're going to talk about transformation. I will share my screen here. Give me a second. And this is a series of presentations that uh, we normally do. This is after our last book um, was released, Transforming While Performing. And it's, it's, it's a little bit of a mix about culture and, and about technology and uh, about opportunities. Now with COVID-19 and what we're living right now, this just sort of accelerated the, the need to embrace some of these principles. By no means, this is a prescription. It's more of a guideline um, for companies and for businesses to, to think about you know, talent, their talent, and, and to think about you know, how to leverage the opportunities that, that, that being digital provides or put in front, uh, puts in front of, of, of business. So, Unfortunately, this, this time our voting system is not working. This is an interactive presentation. Um, I, I updated my browser uh, yesterday, it's just not working anymore now, but we will do all the content anyway. You will see some questions uh, here. I will provide the typical answer that we get um, so that you know, we, can, we can continue with the flow, but um, just to, to let you know that unfortunately we're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to vote today. Um, so this starts with the first questions and normally what we ask is, you know, this is a generational question. What happened to the previous generation? Do your parents work or worked in a software related job? And in most cases, the answer obviously is no, right? Um, the executives of today, uh, normally, you know, software was not the big thing uh, in the previous generation, but now it's. Um, and um, here I'm going to show, uh, just one second, a typical case of three people. Uh, one second. Let me just figure this out. There we go. One second. Is my browser doing things again? Let me just rephrase this. I will have to stop sharing for a second. One second.
Okay, hopefully you can see my screen now. No, uh, there. And now? Yes. Yes, okay, sorry about that. <laughs> it's, it's technology, right? We're supposed to have it nailed, but with Zoom now, everything changes. <laughs> so, okay, so I'll, I'll present here. There's these, we start with people, right? So we'll, uh, Alex, Daniela, and Christina, uh, I want you to meet them. Uh, Alex, the first guy is from a small town in Romania. Um, we are not seeing the next slide, Andres, if you want to. What do you see? What? Sorry. We are not seeing the, the pictures. We are not seeing the pictures. Right. What we are seeing is the cover page. You are seeing the cover page. That's yeah. very interesting. We probably have two screens going on. All right, let me just see. What about now? Yes. Oh, yes. 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 All right. Oh, okay. So, so. <laughs> <laughs> As I was, I was mentioning, Alex is from a small town in Romania. These are three real people that work for us. His parents worked at the same jobs that his whole life. Uh, his dad was a chemical factory, mom a school teacher. Uh, he got a computer when he was 10 and fell in love with video games. And today he's the technical director on the East Coast in the US and lives in New York City. And then uh, Daniela um, was born in Buenos Aires. Uh, she's the oldest of three sisters. Her passion for technology grew from a young age, and despite no other member of the family worked in a high-tech job, she actually um, had a passion for designing uh, digital products, and today she's a UX designer and an ambassador for women uh, for UX in Argentina. And the last one is Christina. Uh, her parents met um, while her, her uh, dad was deployed with the US Army in uh, Japan. She lived all over the world. And after high school, a job offer put her through uh, school to learn computer science. And today she's a client partner and a technical director for us, uh, working for some of our strategic, um, strategic partners. So, you know, these, these are three different people, uh, th three different paths and examples of how technology really shifted their work life uh, in a couple instances, you know, where, where they actually chose, chose to live. And um, so what we have um, to cover today is uh, number one, we're, we're going to cover and look at the current talent shortage crisis, uh, the size of the issue, the issue. And for context, we will look into the industrial revolutions, the challenges and opportunities that cost them, as well as the nuances between the revolutions of the past today and the ones we're likely to see in the future. And then um, we will develop um, what would you see there on the screen? Uh, what does it mean to transform what we perform and with purpose? This is the sort of three part statement, uh, making experiences human uh, with mastery at the core and, and playing to fail. And that sort of narration will just go through, uh, the, that, that's gonna be sort of the framework of the presentation. So let's, let's get started. So, um, as you know, the global target shortage, what I was trying to demonstrate is, you know, the people in technology, the people that are ready for the digital age. Today, um, between uh, the people that are ready and the people that are needed, um, the Corn Ferry released a study in May uh, of 2018 stating that by 2030, we could see approximately a talent shortage of 85 million people. You know, that's roughly the size of, of Germany. So why, why is the number so high? Uh, there are not enough candidates with the right skills, um, obviously, and some candidates lack simple problem solving, uh, critical thinking, and creativity. Um, in other words, sort of the talent development has not factored, was never factored as a, a, fa as a variable for growth in companies. So we normally see as talent more of a short-term training path, but we never see it as a long term that's actually going to impact the socioeconomic or socio um, uh, positioning of, of countries in regions. So we believe that today, um, uh, focusing on closing the talent gap is, is actually an amazing opportunity to differentiate ourselves and make, um, make everybody not only fit, but you know, companies also and businesses ready for growth. We believe that mastery is a function of growth. So 
is, is, there, is there a systematic connection between both growths, right? One of the growth of the people and the growth of the, of, of the companies and growth of the business. Um, and it's sort of, let's see, if we, let's see if we can come up with an answer. You know, just going back into the industrial revolutions, people and business develop and grow all the time, but really the maturity cycles between them don't of, often align. And if you look into the industrial revolutions, only a few people benefited in the short term Lots of people were actually losing from disruption, but in a digital era like we're living right now, it takes really more time to develop the soft and the hard skills to be competent, which actually widens that gap. So we need to build a more holistic strategy to really narrow this back, uh, this 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 gap. And then if we go back in time, um, if you think you know, without these disruptions, um, our lives and the the way society functions as a whole. Um, would in, be entirely different. And uh, after the semiconductors and the personal computer, uh, there has also been a great deal of talk uh, around the fourth industrial revolution. That's where artificial intelligence, uh, augmented and virtual reality, 3D printing, connected things, <clears throat> decentralized networks and, and gen genome editing are, are, are part of. The combination of these technologies is sort of transforming our society. And it's mostly software, actually, so much so that it has become the business, the core of the business, and their entire business are running on software alone. So the impact on how we acquire and use products and services, how we learn, connect and live is evolving in decades faster than our lives have evolved in hundreds of years. So while transformation, this transformation is happening, we're also starting to see higher purpose emerging. Some with organizations, so there is a culture uh, shift required um, in organizations and in society overall. <clears throat> so the term uh, of digital transformation has become sort of subjective, complex, and overused. So instead of trying to prescribe digital transformation, we can question ourselves. How can organizations become software companies that truly solve for the bigger issues that we face today? So the first step, is to look at current big issues as opportunities. Um, and let's just walk through this. So is the best, the best we can do with traffic? Or you know, education, especially in the US, is expensive with no success guarantees, not even a success fee, right? So there's no skin in the game at all. Is this the best we can do here? Or you know, in all industries are, are getting disrupted. The retail sector is facing an immediate sort of adapt or die scenario, but you, companies like Amazon are seen as threat. But if you think about it, some retailers really needed that shakeup, right? Call it cost sensitivity, price pressure, whatever the root cause is, somewhere along the way, customer service was thrown out the fence and it lost touch with what really matters. And by the way, you will have opportunities to um, ask questions. This is going to run for a few minutes. Um, but think about the questions that you want to ask as I'm developing the presentation. This is sort of a TED style. So make sure that you know, if you have questions, you can put it in the chat window, and then I can answer them all together. So what about the relationship we have with technology? Right? Some people have come up with some designs to deal with walking and looking at our phones. It's obviously a joke, but we have not really solved this paradigm. Right? Um, and travel, well, um, especially now, right? There's nobody at the airport today, but, um, <laughs> but it used to be like this. Um, so if you had to find a common denominator, um, experience was lost as we scale the business and industry. And there is a lot of room for improvement, a uh, lot of challenges, which also means a great deal of opportunity. So I hope that you agree with me that it's time for a change in mindset and we can bring the, the first point, um, the, which is normally what happened here is that the industrial strength, strength processes, are, as we were growing as societies or businesses, have really replaced uh, craftsmanship. And the emotional connection um, that used to exist between products and services and the, uh, the human connect that existed sort of was rationalized to the point of extinction. So we never think about experience when we're building large scale things. And that's one of the root causes of the issue. So just coming back to the framework, 
um, let's dive into, okay, what does it take to make experiences more human? Um, the human aspect of, uh, of, of experience, right? So it, this doesn't mean hiring a human to talk about your product or be the face of your company. It has nothing to do with that. It's so bas basically build that, that emotional connection as the core purpose of the experience. So if we cannot achieve this, trust me that the investments that we make in building technology don't, re don't really mean much more than the old ways doing it without the technology, right? So this is another question that I unfortunately won't be able to use, but you know, do you spend more hours of your day with your computer or with other humans to communicate or through, you know, you would use technology to communicate with others? Well, especially now, <laughs> the answer is um, a lot of time, right? So most of the time we are using technology to communicate with family, to communicate with friends, with coworkers. So, you know, how many um, are we thinking about this now, right? Um, who's working on a project that involves emotional state perception, um, experience through technology? You know, you see, you know, these kids now going, you know, because my, my, children go, my, children, my children going to school online, like everybody is doing it, is so very um, unsophisticated and, and it has so many issues because really we haven't really worked on, on this, on, on enabling the humanization through technology. And these days, sort of devices and machines are built to really help scale interaction between businesses and customers. So we have to dig deeper here. Um, so there's room uh, for growth and improvement, which means again, huge opportunity to compete better. Um, let's look at uh, some examples of what I mean. And this is, uh, this, this is her, her, her name is Rana. She's the CEO and founder of Affectiva. Um, this technology captures facial reactions and analyzes emotional responses in, in an effort to integrate technology with emotion. It's sort of the EQ, you know, emotional quotient through deep learning. Um, it helps to add that to uh, digital products. And, you know, so our faces are vessels of emotional communication. We transmit more data with our expressions than with what we say. And Affectiva collected billions of frames um, from about 7 million faces in nearly 100 countries. And they process these images via uh, deep learning algorithms that increase the level of emotional perception, all as the database got um, larger. Um, so it's, it's, right now it's, it's able to quickly predict the most accurate emotional responses. So this is part of the future, right? Business that understand and adapts to emotion. Uh, let's look at some application examples, what we mean here, right? Um, so imagine making the car Emotional sens emotionally sensitive with the aim of improving safety, safety on the road, right? Are you distracted? The car will tell you that you're distracted. Just wake up, right? Or just, you know, really, you know, park or pull over. Remember the traffic picture? So the traffic, um, it, it, it's, it's very interesting what we can do here. Uh, project the impact we can make to traffic, right? Emotionally aware systems, better road safety, and more efficient flow. Um, today, the mapping technology can basically allow us to get from A to B and gives us a couple of alternatives. So if we combine these capabilities, we can evolve to itineraries that are the results of analysis of the entire relevant traffic network, considering with desired arrival places and times and priorities, right? An ambulance is not, doesn't have the same priority as a regular, a regular car. So we can envision an intelligent and decentralized IoT, uh, you know, Internet of Things ecosystem, where millions or more data points would make the entire traffic network improve all the time. So, of course, we will need infrastructure updates, but software just by leveraging a learning system can make a big impact in the overall quality of the traffic system. It makes it more human, really. So these humanized experiences can also change the way we learn. It's expected that by 2024, more than 40% of learning management tools will be enabled by artificial intelligence capabilities, right? So envision the possibility that you, we can process the state of mind of students as they're going through coursework. I'm sure that you currently have kids and you have to be tracking them down to do all the stuff that they need to do online because they're not used to. Imagine that having a system that understands emotional cues and understand when they're getting distracted, right? So as a function of attention state and interpretation of emotional cues, the system will change and suggest different techniques to the students in an optimum, to, so that we can get to kids in an optimum learning zone, right? 
So to round up the humanization, this first point, it, we need to elevate to an experience that helps us not only understand interactions, but rather the real-time data behind the interactions and the behaviors that would drive to a desired outcome. So the entire experience design ecosystem sort of learns, feeds the product engineering life cycle in sort of a never ending journey that rediscovers and reinvents those product life cycles all the time, right? So let's look at some products right now where design and technology have combined, really combined, to reinforce that emotional connection. So, um, you know, um, we can talk about products uh, a bit here. Um, have you ever imagined, imagined an old brick phone with an iPhone-like screen? Um, those are, you know, the, the Blackberries of the past with the iPhone. It would not match, right? So, you know, if you look at Apple, for example, um, this, the success of Apple really um, comes from the, the cultivation of a culture that embraces humanization of technology and design embedded in their product creation cycle, right? Um, and this really, this success um, impacted their entire product line and obviously their, obviously their stock price. Um, some companies, you know, because they tried and erred and refined this process for so long, they really have it in their DNA. Um, they're, see, they're seeing the opportunity and they're thriving. Um, they understand that creating products with a humanized experience makes real business sense. So why don't we all do that, right? Why is it hard? Um, what is standing in the middle of us and innovation? And simply, you know, this is a joke, but, um, and it just refers to the silo mentality. Um, it's really technology teams in many, many cases deny that they need to operate across silos, they need a bridge. My, my, bis my point here is to achieve business outcomes, we normally depend on others. And to elevate the experience, we, we need multiple disciplines working together. Assuming that we know all um, in one sector, one group is pretty naive. Um, although some companies do assume that and seeing uh, seen it from the outside, looking in, it looks funny, but it's actually a huge challenge to partner, right? So we need to find a way to partner and break down this, um, uh, silo mentality in order to achieve this level of greatness and humanization in the products and the, in the, and, and the uh, additional caliber of design in the cycle. So uh, when I mentioned the word partner here, it could be anybody, like it could be groups of people inside or outside the company, uh, partners are, uh, could be stakeholders, managers, other divisions, marketing, supply chain, you know, the, the people that I normally depend on and inter interact with, interact with for input and for output. So transforming the experience is not just an engineering problem anymore, right? Sometimes, you know, people think that, oh, but well, that's a problem for the technology guys. It's not, it's a problem for the business as well. It's a design challenge, it's a business challenge, and of course it's an engineering challenge. So if we look, if we work alone, like the digital people versus the not so digital people, we will not achieve the vision and the purpose. We need a joint culture, sort of a combined jo joint DNA. And this uh, is another question that I will answer myself because we cannot vote, but it's normally this goes, okay, so if partners are all these uh, of constituents, right, all these managers, or how much time um, do you spend waiting on dependencies from them? What actually breaks the flow? What makes your organization less agile, right? And zero would be absolutely no friction. You have full autonomy and it just, everything flows and 100% is total friction. Normally, the answer that I get in big audiences is around 70%, right? So it's very, very high friction. Why? Because we, we work in a lot of silos. We have to break and bridge across them. Um, so, you know, an innovation culture uh, requires that everyone to be in, involved and have a shared vision and set of values and the ability to work across, uh, cross functionally, right? Um, design, engineering, QA, uh, the business, working together. And we need to understand and redefine really what partnerships is like, are like. And the first thing is to understand what kind of partnership do I have, right? And we have a sort of two ways that we see as partner. One partnership is transactional, right? So the typical train of thought when people mention partnership is it's sort of a tactical delivery to prescribe requirements. If we're doing software, for example, you want an interface or microservice and then you code against it, that's sort of a transaction. But transformations where we're shifting towards which we believe is required for transformation 
is a co-creation relationship that is driven by a measurable business outcomes, things that we can measure, right? Is it revenue? Is it efficiency? Is it cost? Is it better experience? Is it more products sold? Where we agree how we nurture, nurture and motivate people, where we embrace the notion of market disruption and elevate product design and engineering accordingly, which means we are synchronized. We live in sync. We have seen across hundreds of projects in many com uh, companies that a transformational scope, a transformational partnership is enabled by a culture that is actually compatible. And the out atomic unit of the partnerships are really teams, right? We, um, at Soft Vision, we call them pots, which are in their raw form, basically pots are maybe squads, they call it squads, or Shramdan teams or Kanban teams. But at the end of the day, we, they're cross-functional teams, small cross-functional agile teams. I'll talk more about this in a minute. But let's look at the data, why it's important. So at higher maturity in a product ecosystem, the impact of, of is very significant when you compare to other teams that don't have this level of in engagement and cross-functionality, right? The metrics um, are across, these are real metrics and are across hundreds of pods, you know, teams, cross-functional teams working in programs for about over a year. The performance boost boost is, is really impressive. And you, you would think that would cost more, that these are people that cost more to the company because they're more qualified. It's actually the opposite, really. I mean, the value delivered and the go-to-market um, over the go-to-market gain and efficiency and velocity overcompensate for the investments in making that partnership work. So it makes sense to think about, okay, so how do we make these partnerships, these bridging across different silos work and how do we enable um, a culture of, of, of innovation? So again, reminder for you guys, please use the chat post um, for, for your questions and I'll address them at the end and let's continue. Now let's address number two. So we described making dig digital experiences more human, now we have the mastery section, right? So how do we get, get better over time and really help within our own um, control, within our own company, narrow that talent gap, right? So um, let's focus on ways to foster the develop, development of talent. Um, this naturally ties with the beginning of this, this conversation when I talked about the talent gap. Um, mastery is what builds people that work in these cross-functional teams, right? And these pods, these cross-functional teams build transformative uh, partnerships. So it's all connected. Our point of view is, is that investments in, in mastery and mastery really is at the core um, of, of growth in companies. And it's a really fundamental component to being digital because being digital implies a constant learning process as technology always con continues to develop, right? So um, talent mastery and growth are connected. Uh, mastery is what we say here, um, always in the companies when we can teach something, right? And, and organizational mastery is when a business can teach itself, when it can actually disrupt itself, go ahead of the curve. So you've, you'd be surprised to learn how much of the growth, growth of, of, your, of, of any company correlates to the personal growth of the people that work there, right? I say oh, wait, obviously, well, it's not that obvious because we don't connect that in processes and we don't connect that in organizational structure to make sure that, that we not only focus on the growth of the business, but we also focus on the growth of the people, right? So let's start with an example. Before I go, um, I sort of, we took an, a Darwinian approach here, and you see that monkey over there, it's some, some fun, but you know, um, I'm sure that you know that to drive a cab um, uh, in certain cities, uh, I live in New York, you need to get a license, right? Um, and we call these licenses medallions. Um, uh, you know, a, a, few year, a few years ago, the medallions, the price for a medallion was very, very high for, uh, high for cab drivers. Um, if you, you know, the cost to buy a permit was in some cases around a million dollars. And where people, people were really investing in these. Uh, it used to be a pretty good investment in the past. A lot of people that st started earlier got, got, got pretty good returns. But then, you know, Uber and Lyft appeared. And if you look now, the cost of a medallion, a taxi license is as little as 100K and really nobody's buying them any, any, anymore. So let's, 
what happened here? What happened in this disruption and how does that connect to mastery? Let's, let's dive into this a little bit. So you see the medallion program culturally wasn't set up for success from the beginning. Um, there was very little purpose. The city never thought about improving the service. They thought strictly about having an inventory, a fixed number of medallions available instead of investing in the drivers and the concept from the beginning and helping you know, drive mastery, create the superior technology, and even develop the technology if necessary. So they basically, you know, they grew comfortable and nobody did much, but administer how much more money you could charge on a medallion, right? So if you um, have been to New York, uh, you know, this is the back of a taxi cab in New York. And um, if you look at the picture, you know, what is the experience like? When, when you get inside of those yellow cans, right? So now compare this photo, the, the back of the cap, with this photo. Um, and you see similarities, right? Um, does, doesn't it feel that you've been arrested? And I'm joking here, because that's the, the back of a police car, right? So it's, it's, a similar, it's a similar experience. So now look at the ride-sharing companies, you know, just to basically fill the void. And the cost of opportunity here is that the money that could have flown into the city is now in the hands of a couple of companies. So let's analyze this in a more, um, in, a, in, a, in a higher level context. And if you think about the culture of a company being influenced by three forces, let's say the appetite for growth, mastery and autonomy, where would you please uh, place the, the cap medallions? They would be pretty much at the bottom, right? Um, so, very little growth because obviously they just managed inventory, low autonomy because you basically, there's no autonomy at all and low master because never, they were never investing in growing any talent to develop any kind of technology. So, you know, um, the, the, the taxi driver uh, that unfortunately invested in that money now is, is paying the consequences of, 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 of very little mastery in investment, right? So now let's consider a different, um, a different extreme and a different culture um, and this is the this is Google X division, and X is the Google Innovation Lab that ensures their growth and longevity as a company. So part of the foundation um, of the founding vision at X was to sort of solve for long-term challenges through research and invention versus focusing purely on short-term innovation. Uh, one of these examples that you see there, for example, is called Loon. Uh, Loon delivers connectivity for balloons that are flying 20 kilometers up in the stratosphere. Um, they deliver Wi-Fi connectivity, um, and it combines advancements in material science, atmospheric research, uh, modeling, machine learning, communications, and, and much more. They're very complex systems. They're not large scale, but I'm just for, you know, showcasing you know, that, that kind of investment and why they do it, right? Um, imagine the amount of multiple disciplines that came together to realize Loom that allows uh, people to connect in areas where there's absolutely no signal and no, in, no Wi-Fi. Um, that's what X culture is all about. It's a, a culture that cultivates mastery and creates new solutions while people teach themselves from their own disciplines, right? Um, not, not software coders needed to come in to, to build uh, Loom. Uh, there were a lot of other disciplines in, involved as well, as, as, as I mentioned, right? And these solutions are, are with higher purpose. So, what, where does Google now sit in our quadrant, uh, in that queue, right? They sit, these companies, Amazon and Google and Apple, they sit in a pre pretty solid place. They focus on autonomy, the opposite of rigid management, allowing, they allow trial and error, and they focus on mastery, growing their talent. And by encouraging mastery in the pursuit of fearless innovation, they score high for growth as well. So the emphasis again is, trying, right? Just proving, failing fast. Um, they, were, they went all in, they continued to build for improvement and invested in their people. Now, they, these companies normally experience high growth because without the investment in improvement in progress in people, they wouldn't have mastered their domains, right? So all in all, just to summarize this point, um, mastery fuels growth and is definitely uh, worth the investment. So let me describe a little bit of my personal experience here because, you know, you think, okay, yeah, he's talking about Google and Apple and, you know, we're not Google and Apple, so how do we do this, right? Um, so this happened to us um, 
tech company as well, but nothing like Google and Apple, obviously, or, or Tesla or, or Minimum. But we saw that we needed to do something different to continue attracting, motivating, and growing our talent because we are competing with all of this, all of them, right? And we built something that um, we are proud of right now uh, that's kind of our core product. I'll quickly tell you a story, right? So we do product innovation and it's vital that we understand the, the culture of the client, their challenges and give them an, up, an outside view, right? So, and then we, we put together a cross-functional team that will help them create a digital product. We design the experience and, and tie that to results. That's what we do, right? So mastery really is all we've got. That's our product. So <clears throat> what we've done is we've broken down walls and connected talent globally. We call them guilds. Right? And we have guilds that specialize in different things. So why guilds, right? So we, we picked the word guild um, because we, we like that medieval word where um, you know, guilds were formed by craftsmen to work together and foster growth and idea sharing amongst their peers, right? That's what we're, uh, guilds were. And hundreds of uh, years later, that's still the case. Guilds are community systems that are interconnected and with new technology, it is now possible to scale craftsmanship by connecting the talent and giving them autonomy to thrive. Because guilds are also a teaching system where everybody builds together, they are sort of the vessel of growth. These three people, you know, remember the three guys that I mentioned at the beginning, who once ambitions themselves as not connected to innovation, are fueling the growth of our business. So why? Why should organizations think of guilds or some of these community constructs um, uh, today? How do they drive mastery in the present day? Guilds normally address the issues that we're experiencing with talent shortage. Um, they create a feeling of belonging that goes beyond strict functional roles um, and improve not only retention, but also open up mind share, right? Um, with guilds, uh, these communities inspire trust among their members. With autonomy being so critical to transformation, trust absolutely must be coming into play, uh, into play. And being a part of a guild creates trust and trust make, makes people purpose credible and feasible. Purpose within a specific role, within a community, within a company helps drive and amplify the engagement. So that is what actually forms the right culture. So by amplifying engagement, we are possibly influencing business and career outcomes. People feel that they're driving their business transformation, right? They feel they're a part. How our guilds come together um, is, is the way that we basically put these teams together. And um, our, these skills, these communities of multiple skill sets really come together in the way of pods, which are these course functional teams um, I mentioned before. When you think of what makes a pod different, um, it's it's a, uh, from a sort of traditional agile team. It's really designed specifically to bridge the gaps across these different functions, right? The framework connects different guilds together and ensures that one team owns the final delivery of the product and can connect to a real business outcome. So it's, it, at its core, it's, it's built on an agile efficiency, measuring KPI performances and providing the ability to scale not only easily, but um, also um, uh, with, with purpose in mind and virtually. So right now, you know, we are working from home. These people, because they are supported by a community, they are part of a guild, they are already connected. There is a culture of co-creation. They don't need to be in one same place to continue innovating. They can do it from home. So as you can see, uh, we could not only do uh, we, we couldn't do what we do without, without these, these core functional teams and without this, these skills. They would not, uh, we would not have been able to achieve innovation at scale. And um, let's continue. The third point is play to fail. Um, and it's very interesting. We put it plain to fail for, for a reason, and you will see uh, as a third part in our narration of being digital. You know, it's, it's not just uh, playing to have fun. And it's not about Nerf guns and ping pong terminants. It's really about how we integrate fun and engage teams in their actual work. It's a term that where it means that we celebrate diversity, inclusion, and personal identity. It means to, that we, we play to fail to make mistakes so that we can learn from within a controlled environment so that we can involve, evolve uh, for the better. Um, 
So this is another question that we had there. Um, and I normally ask, you know, do you personally feel that it's okay to make mistakes? And most people say, yes, it's okay. I mean, we feel it's okay to make mistakes. But then when we, we ask, ask, you know, do we companies encourage failure the same way they encourage success? That's when you have the opposite uh, answer. And most people say, no, right? So there's a dichotomy there that I, I normally catch. You know, this is my history with personal failure, for example. Uh, and how failure actually helped me, right? Um, the person uh, in, the, in the picture there, is her, her name is Marta Arcaridge, and she's a pianist. She's Argentinian, I'm from there. Um, and I wanted to be a pianist, uh, in, in, and I wasn't good enough, and I didn't make it, but it really helped me see kind of the art within the science, and now being in engineering, it helped me really clearly see where there are aspects and opportunities for creativity. Um, so I appreciated that failure. Obviously, it didn't feel good back then when I was a teenager, but uh, it really helped me in my career. Another failure is that's my, that's my last name. It's my uh, uh, family business back in, in Argentina. I was not cut out for the prosciutto business. It's the Italian descent. So imagine, you know, this what runs in the family. But I really, uh, I did the software for, for my dad's company uh, when I was a, a teenager. And that really helped help me and introduce me into coding so you know uh it didn't work out with the family business i left and i moved out of argentina but it really helped uh it helped it helped me kind of self self teach uh programming skills so in a way uh it helped so failure is not that bad uh overall so how do we make you know at companies this a little bit more digestible and um some people from from salt Vision come from gaming um, and we decided to sort of make play a part of how we work because we believe that play is a very natural thing. Like we play when we are babies, we play when they are kid, kids. So why don't we apply gaming or game mechanics to the way that we do the work, right? So because we assume that games are in the nature. So we call this game of pods and it's a software platform that allows us to reward and unlock and be, you know, participate in quests as we move through, um, we move through work, and as we set ourselves uh, goals, we break goals into very micro goals or micro objectives that are easy to get, so that we're always, you know, really valuing positive reinforcement rather than than penalties as as we're going through the flow of work. And um, it not only it not only measures, you know, Game of Pass not only measures the obvious, also tracks team dynamics, collaboration, personal development, et cetera. It's a pretty cool tool. Um, we're gonna have, uh, uh, you're gonna have the opportunity to download my book uh, at the last, uh, in the last slide, we'll give you some code and you will be able to see this in more, more detail. So just to round out, um, uh, we're taught to think that in order to transform, there's a prescription to being digital, but the reality is that there's not such a thing. And we'll summarize here. Um, so if we focus on today, we're making pretty relevant technology progress. Um, we are connected much more thanks to social media, but are we doing it with purpose? Are we sharing with purpose? What's the quality of those connections? So those important questions that we need to ask ourselves. Are we teaching ourselves or are we making ourselves under, you know, masking ourselves under a social profile? As you can see there is the, uh, the, the progression of industrial revolutions. What we clearly see here and we will believe is that you know, we are the cusp of, in the cusp of another revolution, uh, one that's inclusive, where technology impacts both customer and employees' experiences equally, and one that focuses on the higher and the bigger issues than one, one that really promotes an inclusive culture. And, um, you know, let's focus on industry four and five, which are, you know, what we're living today, right? It's not just um, about uh, technology anymore. So in an era, in this era, we can't just apply industrial approaches to transforming services and product to experiences. We need to sort of abandon the mindset of industrial scale and shift to a mindset where craftsmanship and humanity can scale through software, through uh, digital technologies, right? And while um, we'll, uh, that, that will really make uh, a digital revolution focus on us humans. So we need to start forgetting about industrial revolutions and focusing more on digital revolutions as a shift in culture. Um, and, you know, industrial approaches will cease to work. Um, so shifting that value system will definitely, we start at the, at the core of companies, it will forge a digital culture in, it, in between in them. And that will really uh, make people understand all the nuances and what we mean by this and how we think and how we set up processes, et cetera. Um, so just to wrap up uh, in this, this session, 
there are three things that I, I talked a lot, <laughs> but I hope you remember three things. Um, services are experiences and software is the business. I hope you remember that. Services are no longer just a transaction, they are experiences. And humanity in how we actually mold and create those experiences will make the difference. The second one is mastery fuels growth. You know, so investing in the people will give you growth in the business. And guilds develop ta talent. Guilds is our interpretation, is a sufficient way. There could be other constructs. In our uh, world, community development really worked to really create that, you know, ex le that level of excellence. And culture is what enables change. Without a culture um, that is unified and pushes towards the same vision or, and purpose, let me tell you, there won't be, there won't be a, a transcendental change. And the third one is failure makes learning possible. So it's about having fun in the journey and there are multiple interpretations uh, on how we do this. Um, so, you know, play to fail really, we say it's the reality of transformation. It's not a one single solution solves all. Um, it's, and then bam, transform. It's a continuous sort of cross-functional team journey of co-creation and constant refinement. Teams that find joy in the process are those that sustain innovation. And then, you know, I'm sure that some of you are doing some of this already or all of it. Um, hopefully this gives you a bit of a perspective and focus of what we see across many industries and hundreds of projects that we work with. Um, the higher purpose for us all is really to put the needs of our young first and think about that talent gap closing. I hope you leave this room, uh, virtual room, agreeing that through the tailored implementation and constant refinement of some of these principles into our corporate cultures, we will be laying the foundation for, for us, um, for our kids to realize our dreams and, and their dreams in sort of a new revolution that truly addresses the, the bigger issues. And with that, you know, that's a, a link to, um, I think that you're gonna put in the chat to our, uh, to the book that sort of inspired us. Uh, we, we got inspired, we wrote a book about this stuff. Uh, hopefully you capture a little bit of, of the, the content uh, in this presentation and now we're, we can open it up for, for a Q and A. I don't know, guys, if you're capturing questions. Hi, Andres, this is Viviana. Um, so we got some questions in the chat and I'm happy to, to read them out here if you yeah, like. Yeah, they'll be good. Yes, yes, please. No worries. So um, got one here from Fernando Thompson. Thanks, Fernando. So the question is, suppose business owners realize the edge of the home office, such as cost reductions, um, in the future, what are going to be the consequences or implications of, of those kinds of changes? Well, I think that the, um, one of the things that we've seen is that as you go full virtual, uh, full remote, um, a lot of companies are seeing uh, the opportunity of cutting costs or, 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 or sizing capacity, which is less than what they need, because they're assuming that part of the workforce is going to continue working from home. I think we think that the new normal will be a combination of a very flexible work from home uh, remote policy and, and smaller offices, offices only to meet. That's all good because the technology will in, in enable that, but there will be a loss in engagement, that human connection. So we believe that it's very important to form communities that really connect people and that connections are not only to prescribed meetings or prescribed ceremonies just to talk about work, but they also focus on the growth of the individual. Otherwise we'll fall into a kind of a total disconnect and disengaged that will break the culture. So there could be opportunities. I think it's possible to do full remote, but we really need to be focusing on how to reinforce the engagement. Thank you. Um, I'll go on to the, to the, and if there's anyone that wants to jump in with questions, feels for, please feel free. I'm just um, putting hey, in the chat. Go ahead. Hey, hi, this is Amit Kumar. Uh, 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 I'm part of Tech Mahindra group. And um, Anders, great session. Uh, thank you. Uh, love the way you, uh, you know, describe the digital with the experience, uh, uh, you know, and how it works. Uh, one question I work with the business development sales team. Uh, 
and uh, one thing is happening and, and i am seeing it from last couple of years that a lot of uh, companies uh, um, it's the, the the whole purpose and the idea the goal uh, it actually goes in the same direction so how as a company we should differentiate you know uh, in the way you are differentiating yourself in the way we should differentiate because all the companies probably in the same clientele and and talking on the same lines of experiences creating those teams across agility uh, devops uh, digitalization and and making it more difficult for each one of us to you know differentiate ourselves in front of one or two clients whom we are actually competing also so so how, how do you how do you you know give us to the the sales and the business development team the idea to differentiate when the companies are very much digital the vendors who are actually offering to clients no that's a very good question thank you so the um... So really, I mean, what has worked for us is really focusing on outcomes. Um, we sort of created this concept that we call outcome engineering, is how are we connected to the actual value delivered? And that has given us the opportunity to say, uh, and to have some experiences from a different project, projects delivered and how would those outcomes be? And then measure outcomes very frequently as we're going through the project. So to answer your question is, you need to get a lot of help from delivery leadership in order to make more your, your value proposition more, more, um, more powerful, right? Uh, we, I think we, we, we reached a point where we can't differentiate anymore with pitch about this stuff. We have to actually have to get it done. So the more, um, the more data you can collect on real outcomes delivered, and how to measure those outcomes and how to really regulate the engagement with your client and how to elicit value, that's where you know, you're actually gonna create a better experience for your customer and enforce a more transformation partnership. Otherwise, it will always be tactical and transactional. Yeah, thank you, yeah, makes sense. Thank you, thanks a lot. You're welcome. Other questions? All right, well, I saw a question here from Heidi Escalante, uh, an EEP fellow, and she asked, um, how do we sell to clients the concept of playing to fail um, when folks are kind of asking for everything and they're expecting, you know, almost perfect products? How do we, how, do, how is that sold to, to, to a corporate, to a client? We normally, you know, when we demonstrate that we are fast at executing, right, um, we can always, uh, put fail fast in a, in, a, in a controlled environment. What we normally say to the customer is, allow us to run for a couple of weeks, we'll work together, we'll figure it out, test in the market and see what kind of responses we're getting. So that, you know, real data, real market user data, let's say we're, we're developing a consumer application, right? So we wanna hit the customer as quickly as possible. We don't wanna run a whole project based on assumptions. We want to see what is the response because especially if we are innovating, right? So that's normally, you know, in our field, we said, let's, let us run and then we'll just base ourselves on these general assumptions, but let's go check those assumptions. And that's what we mean with play to fail, which is let us play, let's play together, right? And then as we are getting better, let's find rewards for ourselves. So the partnership keeps, keeps maturing and nurturing as we learn more about their business, they learn, learn more about how to leverage our services, and then we grow together. Great, thank you. Any other questions out there? I can keep asking questions from the chat, but if there's other folks that wanna jump in, please. Yeah, but, hi, this is Sam, I was on mute, sorry. Andres, how are you, fellow New Yorker? Love the slide with the uh, cell phone lanes. I <laughs> wish we would have that. <laughs> I really <laughs> in my life. Um, hey, um, I already downloaded the material. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, my question is, and I know this might differ by industry, but in your experience, are there any like specific two or three things that any industry, like all the industries or businesses could do to help position themselves better in the long run, especially considering the situation we are going through right now? Yeah, I mean, the, the, I mean the, there's... A lot of industries, and let's you know, pick banking, for example, they're sitting on tons of data, but they don't really know their customer um, that well. And their services represent that, right? So they're normally substandard experiences. 
uh, we're working with some, you know, banks or, you know, especially now healthcare, just to help them redefine how they directly connect and know a lot more about them so that they can redefine their product life cycle and do it quick, quicker, quicker, right? So I think that everybody's just thinking about, okay, now we're going to be all remote. How is it going to work out? You know, the, m the more you know about your customer is the most important because it's not that you're going to open branches or just physically connect uh, anymore. So there is a big gap in some industries in trying to catch up, especially healthcare in the U.S. because of all the compliance regulations. This, the, the industry always moved slower than the rest. So now um, it's sort of catch up time, to be honest. Uh, we're seeing a lot of acceleration on on initiatives that has to do with you know direct to consumer um, understanding about you know not only uh, just sales data but behavioral data. Where do we get the data? What do we do with it? Applying some learning mechanisms of machine learning to it so that we can figure it out how to service customers better and tell how to customize the experience. So we're seeing a lot of that uh, at the moment. And that normally uh, evolves into the creation of some platform of some product where, where they can connect directly, leverage what they have and obtain more. Good, perfect. Uh, great, thank you. Great presentation. Awesome. Any other questions? All right, well, with that, I am gonna go ahead and I wanna make sure I'm respectful to everyone's time. Andres, thank you so much for such a fantastic session. Really, really enjoyed it. And thank you also for being so generous and sharing um, your book with us um, digitally. Um, so if you guys haven't already, it's in the chat, go ahead and click on the link and the password is be digital. Um, so thank you to you and the Cognizant Soft Vision team for putting on a fantastic session for us. Thank you so, so much. Thank you very much for inviting us. <laughs> it's our pleasure. <laughs> so just a couple of quick announcements. Um, so next week, we're going to go ahead and I'm going to just share my screen real quick. Um, we're going to have our next um, wellness session with, we're going to bring back Eric, Eric Montes. So he's going to do a little bit of, um, I'm trying to share my slides here. Here we go. He's going to share with us some stress management tips. Um, so wellness Wednesday um on next week and you can either register on our zoom platform or join us facebook live and then on friday um our very own david olivencia um he is going to be he is a high-tech co-founder and also managing director at accenture and he's going to be talking to us about collaborating in the cloud and security so feel free to go ahead and register for that session as well um, so with that, again, thank you all so much for joining us. We're always so happy to see everybody's faces here. Thanks again, and we'll see you everybody next week. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye.